and I admit. Just pray for me that I may not covet. Amen. Sure wish I could sing like that. Amen. Amen. We're going to stand to our feet for the reading of the word. We're continuing in our series. Amen. Amen. In your bulletin, you'll find the scripture. James chapter 3. James chapter 3. And I'll begin reading at verse 1. And I'll read all the way to verse 12. James chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Whatever translation you're reading from, that, that's fine. The word of the Lord is the word of the Lord. Oh, I'm going to read from the NIV. I'm sorry. I change from time to time. I, amen. James chapter, thank you, 3, verse 1. And it says, Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect, a perfect man, able to keep the whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouth of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example, although they are so large and are driven by strong winds. They are steered by a very small rudder, whoever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boast. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a word of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of its life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man. But no man can tame the tongue. It is restless, evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue, we praise the Lord and Father. And with it, we cuss out a man who have been made in God's image, a likeness. Out of the same mouth comes praise and cussing. Brothers and sisters, this don't make no sense. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can salt spring fresh water. For a few minutes, we want to look at the subject, uh, tongue safety. Would you find five people and just say, tongue safety? Yeah, I know you're in church. Just say it, tongue safety. Tongue safety. I heard Elder Boyd, he was opening up the doors, or he was welcoming folk into church, and he was talking about saying negative things about our brothers and sisters. Uh, tongue safety. Let us pray. Oh God, we again thank you for all that you have done and all that you are doing. We thank you for your Holy Spirit in this place. Oh God, we ask that you might move this preacher out the way and allow your preachment to go forth with power and clarity. God, would you touch every heart and mind so we don't think about the person who said that to us or we don't think about the person in front of us or behind us to our left or to our right, but we're willing to think about our own tongue. Help us now, Lord, so we might be forever changed. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you watch just a little bit of news, I don't have to tell you about the pundits and politicians. And one of the issues that is recurring in American politics is the gun industry. 
The gun industry, they are those who lobby for the sale of guns. Now, America is unique in our Constitution gives right for every American to have guns. That's our Constitution. Of course, back when the Constitution was written, guns could not spray bullets and kill masses of people. However, it is still our constitutional right to have guns. Statisticians say that currently there are about 11,000 homicides, that's people being killed by guns every year. That's homicide. I thought that was interesting, but I was more struck by the reality that while there are 11,000 homicides, there are 20,000 suicides. Well, in our country, the issue is whether guns should be made readily available. Do you need a background check, or can you just pick one up on your way home, maybe at the grocery store like Walmart? That's the issue. And as I thought about the serious nature because of all the harm that comes from guns, or at least those who handle guns, I couldn't help but think of another small device that has mass weapon power. Oh, it's very small, and the truth is, I don't know if you own a gun. Don't raise your hand. I treat you right regardless. Uh, I don't know if you own a gun, but in all likelihood, you do own a tongue. And just like we understand that with a gun, one person can take the life of many, can do great harm and damage. Can I tell you, I'm looking at you, I hope you're looking at me, uh, can I tell you that yes, you have the weapon that can do great harm and damage to many. In fact, that is the cautionary point that this text opens up with. James starts off, and he wants to throw up a cautionary flag. He, he says, hey, wait a minute. They didn't have guns back then. But he starts off with these small devices that do great things. And he says, now look, if you want to tear up your household, you can do it with your tongue. If you want to mess up your child, you can do it with your tongue. If you want to ruin a relationship that was meant to last, help, and bless somebody else, you can do it with the power of your tongue. In fact, I've come by to tell you that you can easily be hung by your tongue if you're not careful. And so he challenges, James challenges us to recognize that the tongue is very, very, very powerful. And it's powerful in a spiritual sense, it's powerful in an emotional sense, it's powerful in a psychological sense. In fact, do you know that you can mess yourself up with your own tongue? Uh -huh. The way that you speak about yourself and to yourself, you can mess yourself up. And that's why you got to learn to encourage yourself all the time. Every time I look in the mirror, I say, brother, you're doing well. Yeah, brother, you look good. Amen. Brother, you're a chocolate brown, good looking brother. I encourage myself. Now, now, you, now, 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 wait, I come by with recommendation. Your tongue is just that powerful, and if you don't use your tongue wisely or rightly, your tongue will literally cause you to be sick. It will cause you to be in constant chaos. It will cause you to be in constant conflict. And can I tell you, uh, by way of confession, that the people who use the tongue the most, the people who cause the most damage to others, oftentimes hurt themselves first with their tongue. You missed that. Uh, let me say it again. That the people, just like with the homicide rates, the people that have the most homicides typically have the most suicides because they use their tongue to hurt other folk. And so James starts off with these analogies. He says the bit, what goes in a horse's mouth, a powerful, strong horse, is turned by a small bit. But then he goes to the ship. He says ships of all sizes have small devices that are all the way underneath them that cannot be seen. And these devices, the rudders, turn them to the left, to the right. They turn the ship. But then he says, and you know that a spark is small, but it doesn't take a whole lot of sense to understand that a small spark can do great damage. And really he's using analogies to try to press the claim that tongues can be dangerous. But wait a minute, he doesn't stop there. Because after the point of caution is the point of contrast. This is where he really wants to talk to you and I as Christians. He says, now look, as Christians, we don't have the option of praising God and cussing folk. Amen, amen. We, we don't have the option of talking about how we love God and then gossiping about somebody else. Don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. Uh, we don't have the privilege of using our tongues for good and evil all at the same time. 
I know I'm in the Bible because it's, it's in Matthew chapter 12, verse 35. Matthew chapter 12, verse 35 and 36, where Jesus says this. He says that out of the good of a man comes good speech. Out of the evil of the man comes empty speech. Then he goes on to say, and do you not know that you, I'll say it this way, and I will give account before God for every empty word that comes out of our mouth. Now, now I had to stop there and do some etymological studies because it was interesting that he, he, he first started talking about evil, but he didn't just stop at evil, meaning that there's not just consequences for our evil speech, but there'll also be consequences for our empty speech. Woo! Uh, so, so some of the stuff, uh, you, you, don't, you don't need to know, uh, you don't need to say what size dress she has on. That, that's none of your business. That's empty speech. You don't need to know how they got the car. You, you don't need to know who they sit next to. You don't need to know who they married to. That's not your business. That's empty speech. And, and so Jesus says, not only for evil speech, that's malicious. That's mean when I want to do you harm. But just for empty speech, meaning speech that isn't going to bless or help or lift or love somebody. Woo! <laughs> After about 20 years of preaching, you learn you got to bring your own amen sometime. Amen. 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 And, and so all of us need to be careful because all of us can fall prey, victim, or trap to the power of a tongue. I was in a church and somebody said, do you see those dancers? Yeah, I see the dancers. Well, is pastor watching the dancers? Uh, this wasn't here. Yeah, pastor's watching the dancers. Ooh, I wonder why he's watching the dancers like that so much. That's empty speech. That, that speech that is divisive. That speech that is dirty. That, that speech that is not godly. And God says, all of us will give answer now, I've got to give you a theological dilemma because you know we are forgiven for our sins as believers. And yet, the text I, I shared with you in Matthew is tailored to teach us that even believers will have to give an account. You know what an account is? An account is, is every little jot and diddle. 20 cents over here, 20 taxes, $20 over there, $100. I mean, every little thing we say that God didn't tell us to say, I will have to answer to God. Okay, let me move on. Okay, okay. Uh, Y'all not feeling me. Let, 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 let me. I've come by to tell you that God simply isn't saying to us not to just not say evil things or not say empty things, but he's challenging us to use our weapon for his glory. To use our tongue for good. Uh -huh. We, we got to learn to use our tongue, y'all. That's why I've come by to tell you. You, you got to learn to use your tongue. Would you tell your neighbor that? You got to learn. Go ahead. Go ahead. We in church. You got to learn to use your tongue. And the example that I want to lift for you today is a man named Jesus Christ. Because as I looked over the life of Jesus, you know, that's the writing in red. In, in those older Bibles, that's the writing in red. As I looked over the life of Jesus and the language of Jesus, I noticed some patterns in how he used his words. I, I noticed that there, he had a propensity and a practice of using words in a way to do certain things. Oh, y'all not feeling me? Let, me? let me let me try to help you out here. His name is uh, Christian Crawford. Christian Crawford lives in Alabama. After I read his story, I had to reach out to him, and, and my wife will tell you, I, I enjoyed talking to Christian Crawford. Christian Crawford, last year, almost maybe a few days ago, last year, was at his high school graduation. While he was at his high school graduation, there was a medical emergency. Now, here he is, not on program. He's a student, not a principal, not a professor, and not a teacher. He's sitting in the crowd getting ready to graduate and he's excited but then there's a medical emergency so everybody stops there's quiet then there's murmuring and talking oh, something going on i don't know it looked like she passed out i thought she looked unhealthy i mean there's all this and so one of the teachers goes to the student named christian crawford and says will you say something and christian crawford looked up at her and said yes i will this young man 18 years old walked up before thousands at his graduation and said, we don't know, first he said, may I have your attention? We don't know what's going on, but we know prayer is power. A young man 
He wasn't on program. He didn't have a script. He hadn't prepared for this. He, he didn't plan this. And then he said, can we bow? This is in school. You know there's no prayer in school. Can we bow our heads in prayer? And then this was his prayer. I, I love his prayer. I'm going to have to borrow his prayer. He said, uh, we know that you know what it is. And in the name of Jesus, you can fix it. That's what he said. In the name of Jesus, you can fix it. In the name of Jesus, you can redeem it. In the name of Jesus, you can heal it. In the name of Jesus, he said, there's power. Then he went on and he started talking about Jehovah. He talked about Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Nisi, and Jehovah Shalom. All I'm trying to say is, just like that young man Christian, we are called to be Christians, and God wants us to use our tongue to bless, to build, to lift, and to love this age. God says, I've strategically blessed you and placed you so you can bless somebody. But you got to be willing to speak up. you got to be willing to say what God has called you to say. Now I hear what you're saying. You're saying, well, you know, I'm not a preacher. You know, I'm not a deacon. You, you know, I, I'm a Christian, but I'm a shy Christian. Uh, well, I've come by to tell you it's found actually in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. It says, I no longer live, but I have been crucified in Christ. That's what, that's what Paul says. And so now Christ lives within me. Now, now, this isn't hard theology. It's actually basic theology. Uh, it, it's the idea that because of Jesus Christ dying on the cross and then promising us his spirit to indwell us, we now have in residence the word. <laughs> Okay, okay, let me, let me try to explain. You see, you remember, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You know, Jesus is the Word. And so, if you've accepted Jesus Christ, then you understand that you now have the Word on the inside. And so every time the devil tries to trip you up, mess you up, and get you up and do wrong, uh, to do wrong, you can remind yourself of the word. All I'm trying to say is, if you have Jesus on the inside, then Jesus will show up in your words. Y'all missed that. J Jesus will show up in the things you say and how you say. The reason you won't grunt or suck your teeth or roll your neck or comment on somebody else all the time is because Jesus is on the inside. And oh, what a change he makes in my life and in my mouth. <laughs> Jesus is the word. But let me tell you, uh, uh, primarily when you look at the life of Jesus, you will notice one of the things that Jesus practiced was speaking the word of peace. Would you say the word of peace? Now I should tell you this was also cultural, meaning that Jewish people who greeted each other that day greeted each other by saying, peace. That was the standard greeting. When you saw me in the grocery store, uh, when, when I saw you at school, when I saw you at store, uh, because we were Jewish brothers and sisters, I would say, shalom. Now, shalom there was more than just peace, but it was a praying for wholeness. It was a praying for completeness. It was a praying for harmony, that your life might be what God wants your life to be. So, shalom, my brother. Shalom, my sister. Whatever's going on, shalom, my brother. Shalom. What, what, what this first word is, it's a word of peace. And a word of peace means that God will bless you with sudden serenity. Oh, I like that. That, that God will step in where there's been fussing and fighting, where there's been arguing about whose side of the bed and what your clothes doing over there and you not cooking enough of this and you not bringing home enough bacon. I mean, all that fussing. And God steps in with shalom. Woo! It might even be on the inside. You know, when you've been struggling with some temptation, something you've been wanting to do, trying to do, thinking about doing, and, and your mind is just troubled and tossed and turned, and God speaks a word of shalom. And all of a sudden, where well, you were upset, but you were fussing, you were chewing on your nails, you were smoking and doing a whole lot of other stuff because you were troubled on the inside. Now you have peace. What I'm trying to say is shalom is, okay, okay, I thought this would happen. Uh, uh, think of this. Think of a father uh, who has two wonderful daughters and a wonderful wife driving home one day. He's driving home from work, long day of work, but it's the weekend, so he's excited. As he's driving home, he, he recognizes that the traffic's just a little bit thicker nearing his neighborhood, but it's all good. He's Happy it's the weekend. Uh, but then he also recognizes that there is some smoke. There's a cloud of smoke, in fact. And he says, wow, man, that, 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 that's somebody's neighborhood. I'll have to pray. But as he gets closer, he begins to say, that looks like it could be near my neighborhood. Pulls out the cell phone, calls his wife. There's no answer. And so now on the inside, 
he begins to run calculations. What if it's my neighbor? I, I like my neighbors. Well, no. What if it's, if it's my home? I mean, it couldn't be my home. So he's driving. As he gets to the streets, he recognizes that the fire is on his street. He can't get to his house because there's cars everywhere. There's a fire truck, there's an ambulance, there's a police. And the police officer says, sir, is this your street? He says, this is my street. He gets as close as he can, he jumps out the car, and he begins to run. He's sprinting towards his house. He's trying to see, is this my house on fire? Uh, how's my baby girls, and how's my wife? Uh, but as he's sprinting there, a fireman steps in front of him as to stop him. And then he says, that's my house. And as he runs, the fireman reaches out and stops him. And the fireman says one thing. Fireman says, we have your family. Woo! Yeah, no, no, wait, 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 wait. Uh, emotionally, he was troubled, upset, and churning. But all of a sudden, even though his house is still on fire and everything he owns is burned up, he has such a great sense of peace, he doesn't care anymore about the house because they have his family. All I'm trying to say is uh, what serenity is when God steps in and suddenly takes all the stuff that had messed you up and gives you one thing to lift you up and it will change and turn everything else around. Uh, Y'all just have to pray for me. Please pray for me. It's John 14. Uh, John 14 where Jesus promises peace. He says, uh, not the peace that the world gives do I give unto you, but I give you peace that the world cannot take away. He says, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, you will be there also. He says that even in my going, we'll still be together after a little while. All I'm trying to say, whoo, God, thank you, is one of the inheritance of the child of God is peace. I know people like to talk about prosperity, and I'm not against prosperity. But if there's anything that I'll shout on in a minute, it's peace. Because God has shown me time and time again that he will give me peace. That God will give me such calmness that I won't be upset. People be saying to me, Pastor, you ought to be more upset. Nope. Not me. I got peace. <laughs> Praise God. Let, let me tell you something. I hadn't planned to tell you this. My brother called me. It was last week. He was taking my mother to the hospital. And he called me and said, uh, Hodari, I said, what's up, man? He said, uh, I lost mom. And, you know, this big hospital. And I sort of chuckled on the inside because my mind, it, sometimes it runs real fast. I started laughing on the inside because my mind went to the, 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 did he say we lost mom or did he say he lost mom? And when I realized that we didn't lose mom but he lost mom, I said, well, just keep looking for her. We'll find her. Y'all missed that. The issue was, is she still alive? Good, she's still alive. Keep on looking for her. And we find that she, of course, had walked a couple miles home because that's just my mama. But, but, but the point is, well, God will give you peace even in your storm. <sighs> One of the words that God calls you and me to speak into the life of others is a word of peace. God wants us to approach people who are troubled, to approach people who are going through trials, to approach people who need a word and give them a word of peace. That's not the only word that Jesus practiced. I could give you time and time again where he practiced. I could tell, I could say when it was a storm on the boat. I, I could say when it was uh, Mary and Martha during Lazarus time, but, but I won't do that. I, let me move on to the next word. One of the words that Jesus practiced giving people, he gave them a word, a provocation. Would you say that provocation? Now, I'm surprised some of you didn't shout because there are some people who love to give a word of provocation. Amen. <laughs> a word of provocation is different than a word of peace. You see, a word of peace is sudden serenity. A word of provocation is a sudden stirring. When God will place you into someone's life to say, wait a minute, you got to do this differently. You got to get up. <laughs> it was Jesus who met a, a man who had been at the pool of Bethesda. The pool of Bethesda with five sides. The man had been there for 38 years. Y'all, I'm 38 years old. That's a long time to be at the side of one pool. He didn't just have a little uh, sack there. He had built a little house there. I mean, the brother had learned to live on the sideline. He was stuck. He was stagnant. He was stationary. He was still there, and he was sorry. And Jesus said to him, do you want to be well? Now, we often miss that. We often miss that. That he would dare approach a man who had been stuck, 
stagnant, still, and stationary for 38 years and said, do you still want to stay here? Every now and then, if you are honest with yourself, if you are honest about life, that people can get stuck. That they can get stuck in place. Stop trying. Stop doing. Stop moving. And, and, and every now, it takes somebody to go who has help them or is willing to help them to speak a word to say, do you want to do the same thing you've always been doing? The same way you've always been doing it? Or do you want something better? In fact, the text goes on to say that he would say to the man, uh, arise and sin no more. Later on when he met him in the temple. The idea I want you to grab hold to is the word arise. Because Jesus often spoke to people who had some decision in their destiny 